Good morning. Hi. Uh, my name's Connie Ozawa. I'm the director of the Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning, and I welcome you to CityWise, Bre Breakfast with the Toulon School. Um, before we get started, I just want to make a few uh, remarks. First, I want to acknowledge our uh, new dean this year, Dr. Um, dean Percy. So Steve came in June of last year, and he's already done remarkable things in our college. So if you haven't met him yet, please you know, make some time at the end of um, this morning's session to, just to make some contact. I also want to acknowledge and thank um, our two staff, Brittany Mangan and Katie Kitza, who helped to put this whole thing together today. So. Okay, and um, so just a, a little bit about the CityWise series. For those of you who haven't come before or, um, or are wondering kind of what, what we're up to here. Um, basically, City, we're in the fifth year of CityWise. So this is the last session for the 2014-15 academic year. Um, but we started this in 2010. Basically, as an initiative to, to um, provide a, a venue for our faculty to share with you, our community, um, the research and work that we're doing. Um, and the idea is, is that these would be opportunities for us to really just converse about the work so that we can make sure that the research and teaching that we're doing in the university is making, is making sense in the community and addressing kind of the important issues from a, a range of perspectives so that we can help to contribute to making this place a better place for all of us to live. So, um, so with that in mind, you know, every other month we have been holding these CityWise sessions and a different faculty member has presented on the research that they've been um, spending their time on. So today we are very fortunate to have Dr. Lauren Letzenheiser. Uh, Lauren came to Portland State in 2002. He's a sociologist and um, as a sociologist, what he's been doing is studying energy conservation and energy use. So that funny little factor that tends to screw up what engineers spend so much time working on, right, is the people in the picture. So uh, Dr. Uh, Lauren is an internationally known and nationally uh, very well respected expert in this field who's been working for about the last two decades on energy conservation issues on the west coast of the United States, um, with particular focus in that small nation state to the south of us, California. <laughs> so without any further ado, I'll just turn the floor over to Lauren and, and we'll hear about what he's been working on. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. So does the mic work? I guess it does, yeah. Okay, yeah, Connie said I'm a sociologist. There are very few social scientists who do work on, on energy, so it's been a bit of a lonely operation for, for a while. But actually, we're going into our eighth um, session now for the International Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference in Sacramento, rotates between Sacramento and Washington, D.C. And so that's been a really interesting recent development where the energy policy world is starting to take what people actually do with energy uh, seriously. And this is the, we just about uh, celebrated the first anniversary of a brand new international journal, uh, Energy Research and Social Science, which is sort of taking off like a rocket. So, um, so it's a nice time to have this conversation, I think. I'm going to uh, cover a lot of territory. A lot of this is stuff that I've never presented in one place at one time before. Um, and in fact, our final report of uh, one of our studies that uh, took four years is still in the process of review in the California Energy Commission, so you get a little bit of a preview on some of this stuff. So some of the high points, um, I want to talk very briefly about energy and CO2 and why we care about energy, which has a lot to do with CO2 nowadays. Um, most of you know this, so we're going to be pretty, pretty speedy with that. I want to give you some background on energy efficiency policy and people and how people do and don't fit into that framework. Um, I want to talk uh, specifically about the, uh, some of the key points from the research that we've done in California and then, because I've been asked to apply this to the local scene, which is important, um, to talk about possibilities for Portland and particularly for PSU. 
Uh, the moral of the story is that leaving people out of consideration in this system is a big mistake, even though we've been able to do that for about three decades fairly successfully. Um, but doing better is going to require a much uh, broader framework and new way of thinking about the whole problem. So why energy? Well, for a variety of important reasons. Energy is everywhere. This is a physical system that we live in. And what humans basically do is convert energy from one form to another. Um, at the same time, it's invisible. We're completely dependent on commercial energy production and distribution. Uh, but it's invisible and taken for granted until the lights go out. And then we realize how dependent we are on those kinds of systems. The electric grid itself is the largest capital investment in the history of the planet. And it's also the largest technological system that's ever been compiled or and, and operated. Um, energy has been cheap and abundant until we have crises, which we've had a number of. Um, so again, it's something that never really appears on our radar screen very often. But it comes with a variety of environmental harms, from very small and local to very, very large and potentially long term. And from an urbanist point of view, it's the lifeblood of cities. It's what allows cities to, to function and, and be what they are. Um, this is sort of a, used to be a common graphic. The, the Federal Department of Energy doesn't produce this anymore, which is kind of interesting, um, or at least doesn't publish it. Uh, this is basically the flow of energy through the U.S. society. The numbers are over a course of a recent year. Uh, on the left are the sources of energy, ranging from solar to coal to, to petroleum and so on. As it flows through the middle, um, various kind of technical processes occur. And on the far left are the actual end uses of energy in the society. So just to give you kind of an overview landscape picture of what, how this works, I've circled a few things that I think are important. One is the renewable piece of this, wind and solar, um, or the, up here, the, the wind and, and uh, what do I have there? Wind and hydro piece, which would be most important to us in the Northwest, is minuscule in comparison to the overall system. Um, petroleum is huge, as, as is coal, and we can see that. The electric transmission generation system up here on the top is a big piece of the story, and we can see that it's heavily fueled by coal on a national basis. Um, the residential part of the picture, which I've been interested in all along, um, and particularly know something about, is also a relatively small part of the picture until you factor in transportation at the bottom, which is another big piece of this. And then the little piece up on the, on the upper um, uh, right-hand side of the screen, which is euphemistically called rejected energy here, is in fact waste energy. So what we're saying is that a very large proportion of the fossil uh, inputs to the electric generation system never actually get to the end user. They're, they're waste and mostly waste heat in the system. Um, over the course of, of um, the last 50, 60 years or so, consumption overall in a society has been growing, but you can see that there's some sort of bumps along the road that have something to do with economic recessions and energy crises and these kinds of things. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty continuously growing story, although that slope of that curve probably isn't as scary as a lot of us would imagine it to be. Um, when you take the energy system and mix it up with the carbon cycle, um, unpleasant things happen. We're sort of unloading, overloading that system with carbon as a result of what we do. And so most of our greenhouse gas issues, most of our climate change problems are traceable to electric generation or the use of transportation fuels. So that's the story. And that's why you know, energy has been an issue and a, and a policy topic in the Northwest and California for 35, 40 years now. But in fact, the reason that it's particularly salient today, because it's also an issue that's been forgotten and remembered and forgotten and remembered over that period of time. Um, is because of uh, climate change. Um, so what can be done? Well, a few things are obvious. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Well, you can do that with the, with the present consumption levels by simply shifting fuels and moving more to natural gas and more to renewables and so on. Certainly grow renewables at a really powerful rate to displace coal. But the other thing you can do is shrink overall demand. Um, which is a plausible thing and something that we've been planning to do. It's a, it's a corner, cornerstone of the, of the Portland um, Multnomah County Climate Action Plan and so on. So how do we do that? Well, one thing we can do is draw on the experience of energy efficiency policy. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit, a little bit here. Um, energy efficiency, 
Um, some of you know this because you work in the industry. It's a really powerful and important policy innovation. Um, we usually trace it here back to 1980 in the Northwest Power Act. Um, when the, the insight that comes originally from, from uh, uh, Amory Lovins, uh, his, his, the notion of the megawatt is the idea that if we can find um, a unit of energy that's already being used by someone for some purpose and figure out how to do that more efficiently, that frees up another fraction of that unit of energy that can be sold to someone else. So basically what energy efficiency has been is a set of policies that have said, we can grow economically, but we don't have to grow in terms of our consumption. We don't have to build new power plants, risky nuclear plants and so on. Um, we don't have to build more coal plants. If we can be efficient, we can do that economically. The cost of, an, of a kilowatt hour, for example, saved is cheaper, it has traditionally been cheaper in the most circumstances than the cost of a new kilowatt hour generated by a new fuel source. So that's been the logic of replacement and least cost in the, in the system for a good long time. Um, it's allowed us to grow and it's avoided supply system growth. It's given us marginal improvements that are, are good ones and I think we've done some, some pretty valuable things with that. It is not a climate change solution. Although it's been touted as an important piece, it certainly is a piece of the climate uh, solution. Um, the Conservation Act was passed in 1980. One thing that we don't tend to remember is that the California Energy Commission was created by the Warren Alquist Act in California, and it was marked up in 1973. They reacted in California to the first energy crisis as opposed to the second. And these are some of the key things that will come back to that, and you probably can't read it back there. But the original bill in 1973 asked the state of California to des create design standards for new buildings, which about the same time Oregon was, had a referendum that we're voting against design standards and weatherization for new buildings and enshrining that in state law. Um, minimum, standard, minimum standards for major electrical um, use appliances, standards for building climate control technology. They were taking through the governmental control over the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning stock of the, of the state in, you know, in that period of time. So this is relatively strong stuff. Um, the primary policy tools, and this is where the people part of this sort of comes in, the primary policy tools available to reduce demand have been codes and regulations, which they're good at in California and we don't do much of here or anywhere else in the country, um, rising prices that should push down demand, um, subsidies and rebates. If we can afford to subsidize somebody's efficiency gains, then we will pay for that and we can buy that more cheaply than buying new power plants. And information, simply giving people particularly comparative information about costs and benefits um, of particular energy choices. Um, there's been a continuous and almost exclusive focus on hardware, improving the efficiency of equipment and, and not on people. Um, we focused on buildings and how to improve buildings in a variety of ways and building systems. Um, people's roles in this, well, people are choosers. They're the deciders. Um, the choices that we're imagining them to make are probably mostly driven by economic considerations or money concerns and so on. So that's the way the system has evolved with those set of fundamental assumptions. Um, it ignores what people actually do with energy once they've got a piece of equipment in their house or in their factory or in their farm or whatever. Um, and it's been a, it's been a uh, article of faith in the energy policy world for the last 30 years or so that you don't ever touch the third rail, you don't talk about lifestyles. If you said anything to people about the way they use energy, you could in fact get the Carter treatment. And we remember Carter, that's one of the reasons I wore my sweater. So Jimmy Carter got on the TV and got on the radio and told people that this was the moral equivalent of war in the second energy crisis. And we needed to conserve. We needed not to be selfish, we needed to change our ways. And, we, and the, the way the story goes, we see what happened to Carter and we don't want that to happen to us. So it has been the third rail. Okay. California, why study California? Well, I did my graduate work in California and Californians have a lot of money for research and, and so on, so it's, it's been a good thing. But I've also um, stayed in touch with folks there 
and worked on policy issues in California ever since I finished my degree. So it's been a, a congenial kind of a thing. Um, it's a place of innovation uh, that sets the standards for innovation nationally and internationally. Um, the big bold ideas are actually the way the Public Utilities Commission has talked about new, new generation um, regula regula regulation of utility companies. Cutting edge policy includes some of the most advanced building codes on the planet, um, regulating appliance efficiencies, which only the federal government does otherwise, and this is a case where they push the federal government. Right now, some colleagues of mine are fighting with the biggest electrical manufacturers in the world about how much energy a TV set-top box, a cable box, should use when it's off, right? Which you'd think it wouldn't use very much. Frequently, it uses an enormous amount when it's off. So they're trying to push for something like a three or five watt standard off which the industry say will destroy the industry. And we've heard this story before, but nonetheless, California is pushing on this, and they have for a long time. Um, advanced work on the control of emissions. They've been controlling their own air shed, which is a little unpleasant to live in. Um, and creation of carbon markets, ZNE, zero net energy homes. So there's a really pretty strong mandate administratively, and I think it'll be enshrined in law pretty soon, that by 2020, all new residential construction in California will be zero net energy. It means over the course of a year, it produces as much as it consumes. It'll be the same kind of a thing by 2030 for commercial buildings. Um, they also went out early and deregulated their electricity system with disastrous consequences. So, and that's gonna be part of the story here. So they had a supply crisis and we experienced some of that fallout in 2001, 2002 here. Um, and scale of the thing. There's almost 40 million people in California now, and there's 4 million in, in Oregon, for example, and so there's a lot of resources. They spend $700 million a year on energy efficiency, and they spend $70 million a year on research and development related to energy system, environment, um, and efficiency work. And so I've been fortunate enough to be a recipient of some of that. Um, so I want to talk about three studies um, that I've been involved in over the last 10 years. Uh, and there's some takeaways from those, and like I say, I've never really presented these all in one place before, so hopefully it'll make some sense. The first was the electricity crisis, supply crisis in, in 2002, and the point there is that lifestyle is really not the third rail, at least not in California. The second had to do with the natural gas price spike in a sudden uh, way, and I think it gave us some really interesting insights into how prices and costs work, really work. And the fact that, um, that what people can actually do, the behavior piece of this, really can matter a lot, comes out of the research that we've done most recently. So let's, let's take the first, do these studies in order. So, deregulated the system in a rather dramatic way. Sold off half of the generating capacity, electric generating capacity, to private vendors, including our old friends at Enron, who purchased Portland General Electric about the same time because in part they were trying to set themselves up as retail players in the California market, which never worked out for them. But nonetheless, um, market power of a relatively small number of generators then could control prices in a very dramatic way. Well, at the same time, the utilities rates were frozen, so it pushed the big uh, utilities near bankruptcy and it pushed uh, Pacific Gas and Electric into bankruptcy. Basically, there was nobody with credit to buy power in the state except the state government. So state government had to use its own credit authority to bond, issue bonds to buy power to have the utilities sell back to their regular customers to keep the lights on. So this was really a mess. Um, I was asked to do some uh, studies of who actually would conserve in response to this. Because the policy tools on offer, if we sort of think back, are changing your hardware. Well, how long is it going to take for a new refrigerator to make a difference under those kind of circumstances? California is experiencing rolling blackouts at this point, where in fact there's not enough supply for the demand. So the way you handle that is you shut part of the system off, you know, sort of in sequence. That's a big problem. If you've got refrigerator rebates and industrial motor efficiency on the table as the policy tools, that doesn't completely get you there. They spend almost a billion dollars subsidizing these things, however, by the way, in the course of about a year. Um, what they had to do that was really risky was to touch that third rail and start talking about lifestyles. And so they said, we need to have people, voluntary conservation from people, 
and we need to get 5,000 megawatt uh, out of this kind of a thing at peak in order to keep the lights on. Well, what they got was 6,000 megawatts at peak. People actually did respond. We did uh, two big survey ways, about 2,000 people in each case, and really talked to them about what they had and hadn't done in response to this crisis. Um, we asked them what kind of hardware they had put in, and they didn't put in very much because there wasn't much time or opportunity. Um, they made behavior changes, which were rather surprising. And they didn't do it out of fear, and they didn't necessarily do it for, for financial reasons. They did it for altruistic reasons, a combination of, of moral and altruistic reasons as well. And, all, and a lot of people, you know, like um, very large proportions of the population reported doing at least something. Um, so it was behavior change, surprising. Never imagined there could be such a thing. Um, it wasn't spread evenly across the population. We figured about 20% of the population really did the heavy lifting in this case. And some things were surprising, like turning, not running air conditioners in July when it was hot, you know, and so on. And we did two survey waves, and there was some persistence of some of these conservation behaviors that seemed to take a year later. The energy consumption came back, but the behaviors seemed to, you know, at least the self-reports did. Um, but the other thing was we asked people how this had changed their views, if at all, of how the energy system worked and what the future held. And they said conservation wasn't hard to do. We can save some energy, but they also were doing some things like that anyway. Conservation is sort of an endemic part of everyday life and routines for most people anyway. They're not just profligate, you know, and what, we were, what we were thinking, you know. Um, they viewed the future of the energy system as problematic. Um, they also said that they saw the need for lifestyle change in order to solve big energy system related problems in the future. Now, they didn't necessarily, the way we framed this. We used a Pew question um, that had been used on national surveys. So we're not sure if they meant their lifestyles or somebody else's. But they were willing to talk about lifestyles at any rate. And, but they also said it's not just shouldn't be on us. You know, government and business should do something here too. If, if in the future we have to change our ways, then a lot of people are going to have to do that. Okay, uh, run, the, run the reel up about six, eight years. It's 2008. Um, other things happen that have nothing to do with deregulation. The price of natural gas increases by 40% in one month on one bill for, for everybody in the state. Um, so what happened? So we were able to do some survey work with utility customers right at the time that that occurred. And so we talked to people right after they got their bills. Majority of people didn't notice that their bill had changed for whatever reason, because it was a small enough number because they had plenty of money, or they weren't the person who paid the bill, or they had bought into the constant level billing scheme, or whatever, so didn't even see it. Um, the people who, uh, and, and there was, the, the, smart, the smart money here in the efficiency world was prices will go up, people will use less, okay? Sort of little simple price elasticity kind of a thing, you know, but Economics 101, my friend Economist will tell us this is how this works. You know. Didn't happen. Um, majority also didn't report doing any conservation. They changed their budget in some fashion if they changed anything at all. The people who did say they conserved, and it was about 15, 20 percent of the population, were the people with the lowest incomes who were sort of least able to handle this kind of thing. So we know this, you know, supports some other work. The OECD. Uh, commissioned a study of the economics literature and really looked at, at this stuff a few years before on, a, on an international scale. They looked at all the literature on price effects and, and concluded themselves that, um, that residential uh, energy demand is relatively price inelastic. So that little piece of price tool in the toolkit sort of, you know, now long term, it'll have some effect on what people buy and so on. Okay, the Ariba Project, Advanced Residential Energy and Behavior Analysis Project, which was commissioned in part by the, commission, by the Energy Commission to look at this question of behavior. You know, well, if what people do makes a difference, what can we know about that? We've never studied that before. There's virtually no literature on this. And policy has ignored it and doesn't believe it's true. And it can happen. So what can we do about it? Um, so there's a huge efficiency gap between what we know is possible. Emory Levins was predicting we could run the economy on 25% of the energy 30 years ago. And he still has the numbers, and this, you know, it's true. We can. But we don't do it. So there's this vast gap between what's imaginable 
and what actually takes place. So that's part of it. And this new interest in behavior. Um, we did 25 separate studies. I'm just going to hit the high points of a, of a couple of them here, I think, um, to make a couple of points about this. Um, but, uh, and some of the folks at PSU were involved in this, Jamie Woods and, and others, Dave Saylor and others were involved in this, in this project um, as well. So we did a lot of different stuff. Um, the stuff that I would go all wonky on you and talk about the modeling systems if I could, but I'm not going to do that in the morning particularly. But that's the part I really found exciting that we won't talk hardly any about. California, we discovered, and the Northwest to some degree as well, um, is full of policy models, computational models, simulation models of some aspect of the, uh, of the energy system. Um, a lot of people have full-time jobs manning these models and maintaining them. And in California, we've identified a whole ecosystem of models where the outputs of one model feed another model at the Air Resources Board, to the Energy Commission, to the Public Utilities Commission, the legislative modeling, the economy modeling, blah, 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 blah. And we were able to sort of pose the question for this project as well, in all those models, where are the people? Okay, we know those models have appliances, they have houses, they have money flows, they have prices, but are there people in there any place? And if they are, where are they hiding? And we discovered that they weren't there very often. They were there in peculiar ways as sort of stereotypes, caricatures, averages, normal people. Well, we'll see in a minute, there's no such thing as a normal person. Um, so that was really the fun part of this thing, because then the question could be, if we formulate this view of the world in our formal models, and our policymakers are getting advice on the basis of what these models are suggesting about how things work now and how they may work in the future, then um, what are the consequences of getting the people parts of this thing wrong, if the people really are important to some degree? Well, anyway, that's the part I really like. And, we won't get into that too much. But the question is, does behavior matter and how much? And is there any way we can find that out? So we were able to do some original survey work. We are also able to get a hold of some proprietary um, data sources, um, uh, some work that the Energy Commission has done. So we are able to get a sample of, of about 20,000 households, annual energy consumption, really good characterization of their appliances and housing and equipment, and some OK characterization of who's, who's in, the, in the household in terms of age, income, ethnicity, um, education, these sort of standard demographics, and a few behavioral variables in terms of what people did with thermostats for heating, for cooling. Um, it's very little on water use, but some things, a little bit of things on lighting and other appliances and these kind of things. So we could start to look at some behavior patterns. Nobody ever looked at the data in that way before because it hadn't mattered. We were only interested in the equipment, remember that? So, um, what we came out of that with, and I'll get to this in a minute, is that we really need some new approaches of thinking about this, is what we discovered. And when we discover the people, we discover that our, our, some of our basic ideas aren't up to the task. So, okay, dig into variability. I guess a lot of you guys know how to read these things. Think of us, this as a histogram, except this is a big distribution, say of 20,000 or 10,000 or 1,000 households. This would be their annual energy consumption. You get plotted on this thing, if you're over here, if you consume 15,000 kilowatt hours a year, you get to be in this bin, you and all the other people in this bin. So you get this distribution across the whole population. And say a model might assume that if everybody was average at like 8,500 kilowatt hours a year or something like that, we can use that average number to represent the whole population, right? Well, okay, it did fall right about here, and there aren't that many people that fall in there. So this, this uh, distribution actually runs from about 1,000 kilowatt hours a year, and there are people who consume that much, who, who, are, not, who are home, we've discovered that, and they're not all poor, up to 25, 30,000 kilowatt hours a year. Okay, if you divide this distribution into fourths, so fourth of the people here, fourth of the people here, fourth of the people here, the top quartile of distribution, the people who consume the most, consume half of the electricity in the state. Okay. So anyway, this is, this is what this looks like when you finally say, well, how is this actually distributed in terms of, of real consumption? And this is a pattern that holds, I believe, 
um, true in most places, and it may even be more extreme in other cases. Uh, California's a pretty moderate climate, um, and you don't need that much energy, and overall energy use is relatively low there. So what about behavior? What kind of tracings do we have of this? This is work that Jamie Woods actually did on a sample of about 65, 70 households where we had um, measurement information on what they were doing with thermostats. Well, I mean, do people set their thermostat at 68 or 65 or 70 or whatever the magic number is and leave it? No, apparently not. And in fact, the self-reports that we have suggest that there's lots of different kinds of ways that those patterns um, um, look. And this is what it looks like with cooling over seven days in July for this sample. You're going to like this one. This is a different sample. <laughs> this is what 75 households look like in Sacramento on one day in July. Okay, over the course of the entire day, okay, from midnight to midnight. And uh, the other interesting thing is that this is a very homogenous group. And you say, well, some people are poor and they don't have air conditioning and some people this and that. No, these are all single family uh, homes, relatively affluent, self-selected into a time of use rate scheme. So if time of use rates worked really, really well, in this case, everybody would look pretty much the same and their consumption would kind of at least be kind of depressed over at uh, the peak times of the day and so on. So, okay, we can put a curve through that. I've done it, but it's, you know, it gives you self-confidence and makes you feel good because you can put a curve through that. But nonetheless, this is, this is the reality. That's the reality of the system, the system faces. And then the question is, what can we do with this information? Because some people, and you know, let's say it's 95 degrees out in Sacramento on that day. Some people are not using very much electricity, running their air conditioning at all. And some people are going all over the place. And do we have any idea of what they're doing and why they're doing that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So one of the things we wanted to do is to see what actually matters most. And so we develop a model. It's not a brilliant new model. This is basically the same kind of simulation models that engineers do all the time in building design. And it's very similar to building retrofit modeling if you're going to fix your, have your home uh, the weather or weatherization, uh, energy upgrade improvements. But energy demand then is a factor of characteristics of buildings. Um, fluctuating environmental conditions, demanding more and less uh, energy use, um, the technology, the efficiency of the hardware, you know, do you have an air conditioner, how efficient is it, and the activity, the people in, who are actually occupying the place and what they're doing with it. So we did this as a modeling exercise and one of our faculty, Hua Fen Hu in mechanical engineering and materials engineering here did the modeling work here. So we ran a thousand models um, for three different housing styles, three different vintages. One's super efficient new, some are very inefficient and old. We put them in different climates. Um, we altered the behavior of the people in the houses based on some survey data that we had. So we had real world thermostat setting patterns for heating, for cooling, and so on. And then we said, well, how much difference does the building make? How much difference does the weather make? And so we're putting all our money into the buildings, right? and technology, and we're not putting the money into the people. So it turns out, and I won't get into the methodology here, but we can have conversations about it, that the building effect is minuscule, the weather effect is relatively small, and it's what people are actually doing with heating, cooling, and other end uses that make a difference overall. So we discovered, okay, there's some empirical verification for the fact that what the people are doing seems to make a difference here in these things. Different data set. Um, looked at it in a slightly different way, also did several thousand simulations, um, and, and started to take a look at how does behavior account for um, differences across the population, and could we change that in some fashion? So what happens here is we say, if we take the people who have, who set their thermostat at 72 degrees or 70 degrees and leave it, I can't remember the exact numbers, and leave it, and what if they behave like the people who set their thermostat at 66 degrees and turn it off when they're not home? Does that make a difference? Yeah, it makes an enormous difference because most of these savings, the big savings, are coming here. And this compares what sort of small, easy to do, relatively painless technology upgrades would do. Replace your water heater, put in complex fluorescent bulbs, get an Energy Star fridge, and compares that to what you would do 
um, with behavior change, and the behavior change is enormous. Um, we then look at the entire population of the state. We did this work with the Public Utilities Commission, and they said, well, how much behavior savings is available? What should we imagine we could ask the utilities to get for us if we wanted to do it that way? And we said, well, you know, there, that's a wild guess under the best of circumstances, but here's one possibility. What if we divide up the state into just start with the technology stuff and the weather stuff. We know it makes some difference. So we've got maybe eight different climate areas. Pick those geographies. Within each one, let's say people are going to live in single family houses or multifamily. They could be small, they could be large, uh, mobile homes. So we ended up with six, seven housing types. I think seven housing types. I think age was in there too. How old is your place? You know. So we put people in those bins and then 10. So there's like 70 different cells in this thing or 70 different subtypes of, of dwellings. And presumably there's a lot of people are sort of similar who live in the similar kind of dwellings and so on. And then we said, okay, what do we know about consumption in those groups? And we know there's a distribution, just like the overall distribution, there's a distribution within each of those. So let's divide that into quarters. And let's simply say, if the people who consume the most were to just behave like the people who consume a little less. That's all. We don't want them to be extreme. We just want them to be like the people in the next, next bin down. Slide them over what would happen. And so we did that exercise and uh, discovered that in fact, and it varies quite a bit across the state, but it could be in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 to 50 percent. In some cases relatively small if you live in a, in a multifamily um, unit here, um, you know, it, the distribution is such that most of the people are consuming not very much, there's not that much to save. But in single family detached stuff over here in relatively hot places, if people just shifted in Palm Springs so that they were a little bit like the neighbors, who were just like them except they use less energy, then there's something there. So anyway, you gave us a kind of a ballpark uh, to sort of think about this stuff. And then finally from this research, we also looked at people in the process of making major upgrades to their homes with home weatherization um, programs. And we looked at a, a project, um, even though we use California money in Seattle, um, with Earth Advantage Institute here in Portland, um, where people were doing um, serious home testing lower door testing and so on and modeling and simulation and, and making investments in upgrading their houses and discovered that they didn't make most of the investments that were recommended. <laughs> um, they didn't trust the professionals in many cases. They were skeptical about the advice they were being given. Um, the savings estimates seemed too good to be true in many cases. Um, that um, it turns out the behavior is really a key because that's what hadn't been factored in. So when Retrofit models are usually done. Um, we assume there's a generic person in the house or a generic household in the house using that average amount of energy and so on. Well, a lot of the people who self-select into these kinds of energy saving programs are already using less energy. And they can kind of look at this thing. And so, so anyway, the point is we're not, this isn't a slam on those kind of programs. It simply says that thinking that we're going to give people an energy score, for example, and suddenly they're going to, you know, fall over each other in line to invest in their house, you know, it's probably not the way it's going to work. Um, but the things like allowing people to actually visualize how their house is behaving when it's cold out or when it's super hot out um, seems to have some effect. So when we start taking the behavior seriously, we start realizing the behavior savings can be as large as the house upgrade savings. And we start taking it seriously, we also realize that people can be pretty smart about this stuff. Um, and maybe just telling you about prices isn't all that we need to do if we call, if we think education is necessary. So, and I think the other thing we decided is that, okay, um, choice is important, um, but choices are pretty infrequent, and behavior is important, um, and we, we have just begun to kind of understand that. But there are a whole other set of questions that we've never really addressed. Where is the technology coming from, right? If it could be so efficient, well, why isn't it on the market? Why isn't it more available? And how is it being managed by manufacturers, designers, supply chains, and so on? How does that kind of stuff work? 
And then how do these large scale transitions actually occur? Because one of the things we want to do is change the technology as well as change the practices in the society. And if we look at it historically, we see that there's been a lot of these, but we don't have good purchase on this from a policy point of view. Maybe an academic, historical, science, history of science point of view, but from a policy point of view, we don't know very much about how long, large, long-term social change occurs that has to do with the changing of buildings, changing of the built environment, changing of our technologies, and so on. And I guess I've said most of this kind of stuff. The choices are really rare and they're constrained. How often do you replace a refrigerator or a furnace or upgrade your house? Um, the behaviors and actions seem to be very potent, um, but we don't know hardly anything about them. Um, and then this whole idea of how we shape technology in the built environment as a collective social process is completely new territory. And there are ways to think about this, uh, work on social practices, technology transitions that the Europeans are doing, but we haven't started to do this kind of stuff in the US yet. Um, so let's talk about Portland, because we've got some time to do that, I think. Um, this is where it gets a little more speculative, because so what is the implication of all of this for what we do here now? And I'm not sure, so I don't want to spend an awful lot of time talking. I want to actually open it up and, and have a conversation about what you think, because there are a number of people in the room um, based on the RSVP list who are working in the industry, who are working in government, um, who have an interest in these kinds of things. So if we take this little speck up here in the US that is Portland <laughs> and focus a little bit on that, what do we have? Well, Portland is different and it's not just weird. Um, first of all, Oregon lacks the regulatory ability to do the kind of things California has done. Uh, it's simply because we've decided that we're not like that. So, so right now in California, the, um, they have what's called Title 24, which was the authorizing legislation for their building energy codes. We have building energy codes in Oregon, um, and, you know, it's, and they're, they're not dramatically different or poorer by any means. They're probably here, they're, I'm sure there are people here who are much more expert at that than I am. But, California has the Title 24 codes and they're in constant process of upgrade and revision. And there's a very active code development process with people manning this full time, staffing this full time on the state basis and strong conversations going on um, with the building industry and the uh, energy efficiency world and so on and so forth, but how far you can push these codes. So they're out there pushing these codes right now. There will be zero net energy code requirements at some point in the relatively near future. There are requirements to, to shrink the size of air conditioning equipment. There are a variety of things that are really pretty, um, pretty advanced that we don't do. And we can't, that doesn't seem to be something we can do um, very well. Um, and there's stuff in the legislature right now, I understand, that is languishing and probably isn't going to pass that would have to do with, you know, giving localities more authority in some of these cases, and so on. So, um, energy is decoupled from local planning and policy, and that's true everywhere, including in California, in the sense that our tradition of doing land use planning, for example, which is what we're, one of the things we're good at in the School of Urban Studies and Planning, um, is completely detached from the policy environment of energy work when you think about that, okay? We don't regulate energy prices, we don't regulate the energy system when we do land use planning in the city. So, Except for economic development and the Climate Action Plan, CAP, um, local planning in the Portland metro area is not, doesn't have energy on the landscape or on the radar at all. Um, it's a progressive region, but I've got a little graphic here I'll show you in a minute. But it's, in terms of multi-jurisdictional, we do a lot of things jurisdictionally that's really innovative and important. Um, but, you know, we can't sort of speak of one in one with one voice on, on energy and climate related things for sure. It's much smaller. We don't have an RD budget here. California might have $70 million, ours is like that. You know. But it's not a big surprise. I mean, only about 8% of the West Coast population is in the state of Oregon. Surprising, right? Um, there's only 4 million people here. And we have an action culture here. We don't mess around with analyzing endlessly. We act, right? We don't do research. 
we implement, you know? So it's a very different, it's a very different kind, of a, kind of a scene, you know? Um, the Climate Action Plan is a really powerful uh, statement. And if you haven't read it, you really should. It's very accessible, and it's been, um, it's been modified and evolved and modif you know, developed over the course of years. And uh, public comments uh, went in in April, and there's going to be a, a new draft plan out. And it's got to, you know. But the implementation it is a huge problem. It's more than aspirational. It's very thoughtful. It's incisive. It's detailed. Um, but how are you going to achieve any of these kinds of things, particularly when, say, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability in Portland um, or the Sustainability Office in Multnomah County are charged with uh, doing this? And they have no regulatory authority. They have no, ju they have no jurisdiction over most of these things. Um, they have a bully pulpit kind of, sort of. They've got a commissioner that will, you know. So at any rate, um, that's kind of the landscape there. So I'm going to focus a little bit on PSU and what PSU might be able to bring to the table um, with this. Um, and one is our new graduate certificate. And I'll talk about that. Maybe we can brainstorm a little bit how we can make that work. Um, there's some work on metro scale models that I think we're good at um, that I think could be very helpful in this regard. And then I do identify some research um, areas um, first of all, if, if you buy the way I've parsed the um, landscape of people and energy, where I say that basically people play three roles. They're choosers, um, they are actors, behaviors, lifestyle people, um, or they're shapers of the system. I think that we have research opportunities in each of those areas that we can do with relatively little funding, because we don't have a lot of good access to funding here. But um, that we can do with relatively little funding. Okay, what is the certificate? This is really something that um, uh, very few other places in the country have. There are a few good graduate level energy studies programs in the US, uh, in Berkeley, for example. And, but um, uh, this is an effort by five units, five departments and schools on this campus to take what we already do and do well that's related to energy um, at the graduate level, um, but that is very scattered at this point. And so I do energy work in urban studies, but I'm the only person who specifically does it. There's somebody in public administration. Um, there's someone in econ. There's some, you know, we've got the people in econ and, and Wayne in um, system science and so on right here in the room. You know? So it's a very small number of people. Um, our students have to go find each other and find these other programs. And, break down boundaries by going over and actually taking a class in another school or college or something, you know, which they do. So we're going to try to make that easier for people. So we've created this certificate that is now through the uh, Faculty Senate and we've gotten the support of the dean and, and other deans and this has really been very encouraging um, that allow us to take um, some of our existing programs and package them and then also to start strengthening some of our other courses to have better, stronger energy content. So the Certificate in Energy Policy and Management, I think, is an area where our existing grad students that are going to go into the industry can get better training in some of these topics, where people working in the industry can come in and interact with us and with our students and uh, work on these things. We're going to have an advisory group. I hope some people in this room will be on it from the industry and local government um, who can help us uh, steer and we guide and grow this uh, program. But the other thing is, that th I think we take some of these research issues um, and build them into this curriculum as projects in various courses and so on. So I, I want to explore that. And I think that there are some possibilities there. We've got a lot of really good, smart grad students um, and, some, and some really unique faculty here um, that are, you know, maybe can use this as an opportunity to be able to work together better. Um, Another is if we can actually see the city as not just a cluster of social problems or a set of transportation networks or economic opportunities, but among other things, as an ecology and as a place of, of energy flows and emissions releases and so on, and start when we do our metro scale visualization and modeling and long-term planning um, and being able to put energy and emissions into that picture. 
I think it may then help sensitize us to opportunities when we're doing, making decisions about land use or making decisions about growth or making decisions about transportation corridors and such, about how that could work. So this is just a little you know, quick graphic from, this is a, uh, an annual simulation of where the emissions of CO2 are coming from in Indianapolis. Well, there's no reason we couldn't do that, you know, for Portland. Data is the, one of the most important reasons. Data and accessibility to data, which is, you know, going to be a, an interesting challenge and problem. But once we have data that we can work with, we can do this kind of thing. And John Fink, our VP for uh, research, um, has been uh, a great proponent of the decision theater, the idea that we can create a way that simulations can be done that can feed into policy discussions and inform specific policy questions um, that, are, um, that are important in the, in the region. So it looks like that's something that's gonna develop on the PSU campus. Um, and so then so a series of research studies. So first of all, let's start with choice. What do we know about choices and constraint? Well, a National Research Council panel that looked at some of these human dimensions issues way back in 2005 clearly identified this as an area for research that we don't know much about in the social sciences in terms of how do people actually make choices related that have environmental consequences for products and so on, uh, whether it's cars, appliances, or houses. Um, we could do that. We could study that here in terms of how people are making choices and try to think about um, ways that we could better inform those choices other than just a little kind of a sticker on how much you might save, you know. Um, lifestyles, um, you know, there's virtually no research on lifestyles or attempts to sort out what that distribution looks like. There's a little bit of work on target marketing um, and the Energy Trust and others, uh, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, Bonneville and others have done some of this kind of work and it's, it's, good, it's good work, but it's mostly about how do we find a little market segment and how do we sort of message to them and how do we get them to accept our widget as opposed to some other widgets. Very narrow and focused. So we're talking about what are these lifestyle groups and how does their consumption differ and why is it organized in the way that it is? And how should we think about how they can or will or won't or already do participate in trying to, um, and to emit less and so on? Um, and the fellow down here, I couldn't resist, Ruben Doimling over here is the former chair of the Sunnyside uh, Neighborhood Association here. He's a, he's a PhD um, energy and resources group at UC Berkeley. And he's just finished a study for the California Air Resources Board on very low energy users. And he did some surveys and interview works with the bottom end of that distribution. Um, very low energy users and trying to understand how they do that, what their quality of life looks like and so on. And, um, there are people here, there are resources like that, I think, here, and the ability, and our students are fascinated with this kind of thing. So I think our ability to focus on some of those kind of questions is something we could, we could uh, build on and exploit. Um, in terms of looking at system shaping scale things, I think I'm gonna put that in two categories. One is governance. Okay, these are the players, and I've probably forgotten some, you know? But these are all salient actors in, the, in making decisions related to energy in the local scene and beyond. And um, Connie's given me that, but I've only got two more slides, I think. With energy and, and so, so I think trying to sort out and understand what our institutional arrangements are and the actors and players and how we, what the alternatives are for structuring uh, governance related to energy um, is going to be is a huge opportunity for us. And the other is to look at the social institutions, the way that we create culture, um, the way that we construct our built environments. A lot of the conversations we're having now about livability and housing and infill and multifamily and where to locate these things and so on and so forth have energy components that we haven't, haven't looked at very clearly. They may not be the most important part of the story in some case. Livability may be more important, equity may be more important. But we haven't really seen how these kinds of things we are concerned about interact with emissions and, and energy. And just as a couple of quick examples, things I've been starting to look at myself. This is funny because this occurs um, over in Woodstock on one block right next to each other. And these are three infill houses that have been built in the last 15 years. Okay, so we talk a lot about infill and what that's looking like. And you can see they're getting bigger 
right? Um, supposedly serving the same market. Now, the story you're going to hear, we have heard a lot, is market is demanding this, right? I don't know. I don't know how that market demand really works, you know? But one thing I have a pretty good suspicion is that pretty similar people probably live in each of those three houses. But the people on the right-hand side there are saddled with a very different kind of a thing. And, and in some neighborhoods I see, where people who can afford the biggest, fanciest houses but don't have a yard are sitting on their, I've seen this, you know, affluent, two affluent um, people who live in this big house because that's who can afford to live in it sitting on their front step. Because it's either that or sit on your balcony in the back or whatever, you know. Um, or people with families that have kids living on the sidewalks because they don't have a yard. So anyway, just, think, just saying, you know, looking at the, uh, at the energy and climate implications of that. And then a, a piece of research that we're doing now, and this is very tentative, but sort of looking at what's the lifetime carbon implications of, um, of different approaches to this, an old house, a brand new house, or renovations of that house at different scales. And how do you put the behavioral piece in here? is how people use the house and live in the house make a difference. And so that's the kind of thing we're doing. So that's it. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Lauren. You've really just given us so much information to chew on and digest this morning. Um, but first, we'd like to hear if anyone would, uh, has any comments or questions. <clears throat> And I'll just move the mic around because we are recording this. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, from what I've read in, in the wake of Fukushima, Japan cut their use dramatically. And I'm wondering if you've looked at it compared to some of the things you talked about, like what California went through the West Coast in no, general. Say that again. What was it again? Uh, Fukushima, oh, yeah. following Fukushima in Japan, their demand, their use dramatically cut, yeah. do you think it's relevant and have you spent much time looking at it? Yeah, I haven't looked at specifically what, what they have done, but I know they've done some pretty dramatic things. And in fact, Japan, which is one of the, again, most um, um, societies that's most concerned about social norms and propriety, ends up shedding the suit coat and the tie in the summer and sort of really making a fundamental cultural change. Um, in order to basically get rid of air conditioning in a place that otherwise we'd think just had to have it for comfort purposes. So they've made some pretty, pretty dramatic changes. And unlike their neighbors in China, you can't just sort of order things up quite as effectively. And I mean, so this, this cross-cultural thing I think is very important to sort of better understand what might actually be possible. Um, no, we haven't looked at that much. Um, I, my dissertation research looked at um, at um, 500 households living in identical apartments in California from 50 different cultures and how they did that in very different ways and what conservation meant in very different ways. And, and I haven't even exploited that nearly as much, but they were very important and interesting differences. And so that's another interesting question here. To what degree do recent and long-term immigrant populations have different kinds of lifestyles and different kinds of expectations and so on. It's again, it's been third rail stuff, so we really haven't, really haven't looked at it. And data are really hard. I'm just mentioning that. Already. Data are off, really, really hard to get to look at these kind of things where somebody's already collected it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned there was a study about the low end of the energy use yeah. spectrum. What about the high end? What are those people doing? Virtually, virtually nothing has been, nothing has been done in that. I think your imagination is probably um, as good of data as anybody has. Seriously. I mean, when you look at the literature, I mean, there's virtually nothing. We don't, it's a black hole. Yeah. Since we don't have much research uh, facilities or, wait, wait, wait. oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Since we don't have a lot of research dollars and we're much smaller, what can we do to piggyback off of what has been down in California, how can we leapfrog and take a sort of draft off of their efforts? Yeah, I, well, um, okay, a couple of things. I mean, one is to maybe pay closer attention than any of us do, than I do, to what their research is actually showing. Um, I, think, um, I think it's also 
Well, I think it's also important for them to know that we think that that's important because there is a West Coast Climate Compact, which is mostly a conversation that a few governors have had every once in a while, every few years or something. But there is an explicit agreement to sort of coordinate um, climate policy and work around climate for California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Um, but the sort of implementing piece of that has been sort of, well, every state should do what they can do possibly, and we'll call that coordination. So, I mean, I think one thing is that Oregon could, and local officials and others in Oregon could say to the state, well, let's try to, let's try to figure out how to get some benefit from this collaborative. What does that really, what does that really look like? Um, so I think there's, there's that. The other thing, I guess, is I think we can do a lot with PSU and other institutions, presumably, um, with our students um, and with ongoing research here. And I think, and there is a little bit of research funding. I mean, uh, on occasion, NIA and the Trust um, do some sort of market-focused stuff. And I think, you know, creative minds could think of some ways to, to use some of those resources to kind of glue things together a little bit. The Energy Trust Dean's um, firm has worked at doing survey, con a consumer survey on an annual basis almost, I think, for the Energy Trust, you know. But nobody's ever really said, well, you know, is that survey the best survey it could possibly be? It is for the trust purposes. Are there other things that that kind of piece of work could be done? So places where there actually is something that is researchy that's producing new knowledge, now we could look at that with a with a little more critical eye and figure out if there's ways we could reinforce it, I think. It, it looked like the low-hanging fruit is this elevated people keeping their houses warm, maybe often when they're not there or when they are, but yeah. has anybody done any work on like a more responsive, I know in my own household, I can't get, I can't leave it as low as I want because my partner wants to come home to a warm house. I don't want to be cold. Right. And it's really tough. And so there must be, is there any way that we could have a, <laughs> sweaters? Sure. But has anybody been working on that particular big chunk, that 68% or whatever it was that right. was on your chart? Um, well, okay. Um, EPA used to sort of, have, they used to have Energy Star programmable thermostats. And they used to, I believe, that having a programmable thermostat would confer those benefits. Well, when it turned out in the real world that people didn't program them and didn't understand how to use them and so on, EPA backed away from that. So now they don't have th those kind of things. I mean, so I think, yeah, I think some of this could be done with smarter systems. Um, there's a lot of effort to create the sort of new smart home kind of a thing. And you know, firms, Intel's involved in this, and, and others. There's been a wide range of people, but Microsoft went into that space, and Google went into that space, and then would, retreated from that space pretty quickly. Um, Nest is doing some interesting kind of work, um, and they were recently acquired by Google, and so on. But you know, it's a kind of an interesting little deal because the Nest thermostat communicates, you know, with the cloud. So then all of your thermostat information is situated in the cloud. There are privacy issues. Well, there are privacy issues around that. So we don't have the app for that yet. And it's not clear that we ever will, really. Um, and, and again, maybe it's a segmentation story. Maybe different parts of the population do this in different ways. We have discovered that some of the most energy conserving um, uh, things you can do with heating is to go over and turn the thermostat off and so on, you know. Um, but again, that becomes, that becomes difficult where there's a social situation. Right, exactly. And the other thing, there is no good research on that, what that social dynamics. There's a little bit that's been done in Denmark <clears throat> and uh, the Netherlands where they think about these kinds of things, you know, and particularly gendered-based <coughs> interactions um, around some of these kinds of things around heat control. Um, but so far, that's, uh, that's a blank you know, slate for us, yeah. Well, so um, how much do you think that lack of political consensus on climate change in our country contributes to lack of action at the individual level? And maybe to flip it around, if we had a political consensus on climate change, do you think a lot more would happen? Yes, I do, I, I do. And I mostly infer that from the California crisis experience 
where people went into it across a pretty broad political spectrum. But, and again, I have the graphic up here, they used this flexure power imagery and so on. So one of the really powerful things there wasn't sort of like, well, you know, state government is inept, you're gonna have to step in and save us, you know, although that was part of the discourse, you know. Um, it wasn't, you have to conserve because it's an environmental good because that would have polarized. I mean, it was basically, you know, we're, you know, some really bad people are having at us and they don't, they're indifferent to our politics, but they're doing the same thing to all of us. And so under these circumstances, what we have to do is kind of, you know, get together and flex your power, whatever, you know, we'll show them. And I think, you know, it'll be a different message and so on, but I think if there was a, a stronger political consensus that, um, you know, a sociologist would, would guess that in fact, in some sphere of everyday life, there could be substantial agreement I think on some of these kinds of things, and it might it might turn into uh, individual uh, change. Um, you know, the, there's some reason to believe that um, kids actually discipline their parents, and they learn some of these things at school and so on. You know, and they come home and you know say, well, why are we doing it this way? Maybe we should do it some other way. Um, and so I think there could be some more of that in the absence of polarization. The other interesting question, again, we don't know what people are doing who are off that end of the spectrum. We don't know much about people who may be consuming a lot intentionally because in fact, they figure that that's an important um, attribute of success or that it's a, I'm gonna show them kind of thing. I don't need to save anything or whatever. We don't understand how, how that set of behaviors that from the point of view of people who were sort of, you know, held pretty taken for granted common environmental beliefs, you know, find it sort of scandalous, but there could well be a whole swath of the population that um, okay. believes that climate question. change is a political uh, maneuver, a hoax, <laughs> and that in fact what we should do is, you know, consume as much as we possibly can, you know, so but we don't know. Actually, okay, um, so we have two last questions, all right? So here's the, the second to the last, and then you'll get the last. Thank you, Professor. And I wanted to ask you uh, about energy benchmarking. So the city of Portland just adopted a policy to require all commercial buildings over 20,000 square feet to report their energy usage to the city. And we will be the 12th city in the nation to do that. Uh, California and Washington as states already require it, but Oregon, unfortunately, does not. So when I was doing the research on this, there was very little research. The city, New York City and Washington, D.C. probably had the best uh, data that I found, and we found about 3% savings per year uh, just from setting up this competitive marketplace of uh, buildings having to report their energy usage. So I don't know if you've done any... Uh, analysis, or that's an area that I think I'd uh, be interested to hear your thoughts on. And then also for your uh, example with the housing, that is only right now the city is only doing it for commercial buildings. So there's 160,000 single family homes in the city of Portland. Uh, most people don't know how much energy they're using unless, you know, right. nerds like us in this room, I'm sure, track that uh, assiduously. But if you can maybe comment on your thoughts on that uh, energy benchmarking and reporting on how that works on changing behavior. Sure, sure. Okay, I'm not aware of much research. Um, most of my stuff is focused on residential, although I've thought about and have some conversations with people about commercial um, and know a little bit about that. Um, my strong guess is that, yes, if it's publicly disclosed, it'll have an effect uh, because it will become an issue for the building owner and manager and so on and so forth. If it's disclosed only to the city and there's no broader disclosure beyond that, then, then that becomes something of a problem. But the thing that I would take away from the behavioral research in housing is, is, is that in fact, differences between buildings certainly have to do with um, the quality of the building and its thermal performance as well as the equipment um, and its, its age and efficiency. 
but it also has to do with how people are using the building. And in a commercial building, some of that has to do with the way that the occupants are bringing in things to plug in. So there's a big plug load piece of that. But um, that whole idea of temperature setting and so on in the household works in the building as well um, in terms of the whole realm of activity called operations and maintenance, or O&M in these buildings, which is a very understudied area. The people who are, are good at commercial buildings um, so tell me that um, there's an enormous amount that could be done with O&M, but it's not altogether clear how you get it in many <laughs> cases. Um, some of it could be control systems that are out of whack. Some of it could be control systems that people don't understand how to use. There's a social dimension to this in terms of how the management of the building, um, a portfolio of buildings down to a single building, um, is actually organizationally processed. That could be an important part of it. So you may be looking at organizational innovation sometimes in order to accomplish these behavior changes that accomplish the energy savings. And it could be that, um, and then being able to inform building owners about this, I think would be an important piece of a successful policy. And, and it is unfortunately the case that if the source of information is, um, is the standard um, HVAC, um, you know, engineering and contracting community, they are going to likely be um, not necessarily way up to speed on the human pieces of this thing either. I mean, they know how to fix the hardware. We've been so fixated on hardware for so long that we really don't know very well how to work with the people, whether they're in commercial buildings or residential, I think. But I think it's a great policy, and other people, it'll be great to see how it, how it plays. You know, um, I was told once by the head of the EPA uh, group that does um, benchmarking for commercial buildings that in some uh, statistical analyses they were able to do, um, they thought that the difference between an energy star building in many cases and a not energy star building in the same class, um, in the same geography, had everything to do with how the building was operated, not how the building was configured. Yeah, yeah one comment and one question. When you travel to China, you go into your hotel room you open up your door with your key card, but in order to turn electricity on, you have to put the key card into the slot. And then when you leave the room, you have to pull the key card out, the electricity goes off. I don't understand why the hotel community doesn't adapt this. this. I mean, it's so simple in terms of saving energy. And then the other comment is, um, you mentioned the Portland Climate Action Plan. It was actually translated into Mandarin and shared with our sister city in Suzhou. And I was wondering, is there a report card on our climate action plan and how it's, how it's done? I think it was developed maybe five or six years ago. Yeah, I don't, I really don't know. I think the people at BPS, you know, know about this more than I have. I had a, um, Kyle from BPS visited my class on Monday and we talked about some of this stuff and commiserated about some of the implementation issues. But I, my sense is that Portland is in some ways, even though everybody has a climate action plan now, I think um, Portland is, is sort of way out there in terms of um, um, sort of the nuance and thoughtfulness in that plan. And so, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. And there's, there's efforts there to assemble metrics, assemble data and construct metrics and try to understand some progress and some benchmarks. But I'm not, I guess that's I'll answer to most of my questions. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Well, on that note, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't no. Know. Thank you so much, Lauren, for your presentation. I, th I think your presentation generally suggests to the region what more we can be doing in order to, to contribute yeah. to the climate change debate and reverse trends. So, again, thank you. Um, what I'd like. Uh, I just want to remind you all that if you're not on our mailing list, you should make sure that your email address is um, on one of those boards back there with Katie and Brittany. Um, our next citywide session will be on the second Wednesday in September, and we're going to have a panel of um, presenters <laughs> from this book, Planning the Pacific Northwest. Some of the authors are here, and they don't know yet, but we're going to be calling them um, <laughs> to, to have a discussion about 
um, what's in this book. So this Planning the Pacific Northwest is available through APA Press and Amazon apparently is cheaper, so take that note. Um, it's an edited collection from uh, uh, put together by three colleagues in Washington State and then Ethan Seltzer and myself here. And we've got contributions from um, academics, research, academic researchers, as well as practitioners. And the question, I mean, it's planning the Pacific Northwest. The underlying question is, is, is planning in the Pacific Northwest different or distinctive in any way from other regions? But we're just describing what it is. So we'd be really happy to see you back here in September after you've read the book. <laughs> and you, we can have a lively, you don't have to read the book. Um, we'll have a lively debate about that question, okay? Thanks very much for coming.